Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Green Room Podcast. I'm Matthew Bruni, and joining me once again is Colin Mitchell. Colin, when's the last time you've been called the P word? Oh, <laughs> uh, I was like, what are you even talking about? Um, <laughs> but I don't think really, I, I can't remember it. It's been, it's been a minute, right? Well, here I am sitting. Nobody here. knows what that is. Which you're I'm sitting here. Just say I'll the give word. Context. I'm going to give context. Word. You want me to say that? I, I was cool. You with said like you said three cuss words. Yeah, that's way worse than saying. I'm having that you say it's it. It's not worse. You're, it's definitely you're worse. Full of shit. It's definitely worse. It is not worse. It's definitely worse in the context of what we're talking about. This and so Bruni was called a pussy. Okay. So I'm sitting there at LSU working. And I get a text from our good friend Brady Keem. Said, "Damn, Bruni just got called a pussy." <laughs> and here I am. I'm like, "What? What did I do? Who? I I just I don't do anything crazy." <laughs> and I, I they send a uh, podcast clip. I don't remember the, the name. Some dumb. What is it called? Dumb, the dumb zone. Dumb zone. There you go. And. <laughs> It, I, when I saw it, I'm in a press conference, so I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I, I must have did something to piss them off or something. And then you listen to it, and it was after the Mulkey Washington Post rant. Um, they're like, all right, who has a question? Nobody says anything for about three seconds, which is the eternity at that point. And I'm like, screw it. Put your little hand up. Put your finger up. Like, all right, let's go. Um, and I just asked her about Middle Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> then they they then they proceeded to call him call him the p word as Bruni calls it. <laughs> like as as I'm reading the question, they cut it off and they just go, "Oh, you pussy!" And I was like, "Um, they do give a little bit of understanding to like the situation to be like you know your credentials He's trying to keep his job, yeah." yeah. <laughs> But I was just hilarious because I thought it was actually someone mad at me. But it was just them. It was uh, really funny saying that. <laughs> and then the guy was like, "I would have done the same thing. <laughs> they would have cut the mic. <laughs> they would have cut the mic if I started talking about asking asking her." But imagine um, though, imagine though, right after that that rant, you just opening it up after she just, just said, "Don't ask any questions about this." Just start with... letting off, and she says, "I'm not answering questions." Well, this is a press conference. Why aren't you answering questions? Yeah, no, not doing that today. Um, I like my job. I like um, what I do. So you like your life. Is what I you like want. my life. So I'm let's not just... sure you would have made it out of that room alive. I might have been executed on the spot. <laughs> Call me a fake journalist. This is why the Mayborn is not inviting me back. All right. This is exactly why because I don't ask the hard hitting questions. All right. Sorry. But at my core, to transition, I'm a basketball fan. Right. Colin, you know me. I want to mm-hmm. know the X's and O's. I, I want to know the, the the little details of basketball. So that's where I'm, I'm at. I don't really care about. I wish you opened it up with like an advanced stat question. That would have been way funnier. Right? Middle Tennessee <laughs> runs middle third ball screens, a fourth of their <laughs> offensive possession yeah. in half court. How do you anticipate that you're going to have to defend that? Off the top of my head. There you go. There you go, Kim. That's the question. I would have. I don't even know. You would have. That probably would have gone viral if that's what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> it probably would have been. Gone Twitter would have been like, "This is how." <laughs> yeah. Basketball mulky. media. Yeah, gr- grilling Mulkey with advanced analytics questions. <laughs> well, that what if she replied was like, "Well, I'd rather answer Washington Post questions." Yeah. Like, actually, let's go back to the other one. Um, but to transition to North Texas basketball. Mm. is still going on or it was still going on for North Texas. And we got on here after the LSU game and we were very excited. I was very excited. Let me speak for myself. I was very excited and I was of the belief that this team had kind of turned a corner and was going to make a run at this thing. Knowing full well, Seton Hall was very, very good and the number one seed of this entire tournament. Uh, yeah, the number one seed at the tournament, and um, I'll, I'll I'll let you break it down a little bit. You got to watch more than me. I watched a little bit of it, but um, you <laughs> you kept me abreast as it was going on. Um, I will say I watched some of it in the first half, and they were winning, and then Seton Hall closes on a 10-0 run, 
goes up nine and a half and ends up winning the game. Takes control, wins the game 72 to 58 over North Texas, ending the Mean Green season. Where do you want to start when talking about this game? And we won't uh, spend a ton of time on the game, more like big picture podcast, but yeah. what do you think? Um, it's been a few days, so I don't yeah. remember every single little thing about it, but they, North Texas came out, I believe they made two threes, and I don't have the play-by-play in front of me, but they, they were, were up, and I was, and I was like, they're ready to play. I tweeted that, too, on the account. I was like, they're ready to play. Um, they were clearly having trouble matching their physicality a little bit, but I was like, okay, here we go. Let's go. Let's do this. And I was like, Bruni was right early. And uh, <laughs> then as the game goes on, you start to realize that Seton Hall just has more dudes than North Texas has. I mean, and that's just really what it came down to. It wasn't like Seton Hall was the tournament team that didn't make the tournament. Yeah. Um, I kept citing Ken Palm and net numbers and was like, you know, this will be a way closer game. It wasn't. I will I will fully retract my statement on that because Seton Hall looked it was probably the hardest opponent North Texas faced all season, beating FAU, beating St. John's, beating uh, I can't remember somebody else that they played that was really hard. Um, LSU, L- well LSU doesn't count, but okay. Um, <laughs> but Boise, Mississippi State, yeah, Mississippi like State. like like I think this is st- their toughest opponent that they faced, and um, when you play when you're playing them at their house. And you go down, and then you can't make anything. The biggest thing was Seton Hall's intensity on defense was doing more to North Texas than North Texas was doing anything uh, in play and offense. Like North Texas was doing what they normally do: they swung the ball, they tried getting open shots. Nobody was open. They'd run it. To, I mean, it's not like it's not like they were trying to kill the clock once they realized that they couldn't score. They were trying to find an open shot and couldn't get an open shot. And that was really the story of the game. And they uh, Seton Hall won seventy two fifty eight. But the game was really over with like five minutes left when Seton Hall led 70 to 46. Yeah. So uh yeah. Yeah. It's um especially I mean it was just a rough game pretty much from everybody. CJ Nolan ended with four four of seven with eleven points and seven boards. Um Edwards 23 points, nine of nineteen shooting. I I still, you know, it was kind of hit or miss there. And then Ruben and Aaron just kind of struggled in general. Uh, they combined to go five of 20. Um, Aaron mm. had five. Of, go ahead. I was like, don't even, and don't even get me started on like the missed layups and the missed shots yeah. within a foot of the basket. I mean, there was multiple, multiple of those. And it was just like, what? I mean, if you're not going to be able to hit those and then you're, I mean, eight, eight of 25 from three, I think three of those threes were hitting the last three minutes or something like that. So mm-hmm. uh, just not, you're not making, they weren't making open shots either. Yeah. They got, got out of hand, got to 20, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, we 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 don't need to keep talking about Aaron because it we've talked about it before, like the inconsistencies, the offensive struggles, like so on and so forth. There's no need to beat a dead horse. Like he had a really good game against LSU. Uh, we know what he's capable of, but like there are too many games where he just doesn't play. Like when you play Seton Hall, you need Aaron Scott to be. Aaron Scott like you need him to be at that level all conference level and he wasn't Ruben three of 12 four assists two turnovers so um Robert Allen played 31 minutes three of 12 that falls into your category of not finishing <laughs> at the rim um yeah I don't what, what else anything else on this game before we move on I mean this game specifics it was just Seton Hall just exposed or exploited the weaknesses that we talked about all season and I don't I don't think Anybody thought that that would happen after what we saw North Texas do to LSU? Did this game? So let's let's talk big picture now. Does this game change your outlook of what this team could have been at full strength? Because now we've seen. Uh, we've seen I want to say now. I'll say yes and no. Okay. Um, I'll start with no first. No, because we still have we still didn't see this team play a full season of games together. Who knows what could have what mm-hmm. could have happened. Um, but yes, in the sense that they were at full strength, they did have a really good game against LSU and a lot of the same problems that we saw in the pre-conference tournament or non-conference tournament appeared in this game, not being able to score, not being able to match physicality, um, despite again, doing all those things to LSU. So, um, yes, I would say that more so, I guess. I don't know if this team could have accomplished as much as we thought it could have. I mean, if we look at their losses since being full strength, I'm not even going to count the UTSA game because 
I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt that that's an aberration. Um, and it was their first game back with Ruben and, and CJ. So mm-hmm. weird game. Sent their three losses, FAU by four at home, FAU by six in the tournament, and Seton Hall blowout loss. So they, they lost to three top 60 teams, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the wins, Tulane twice, ECU, Rice, LSU. So since being full strength, they're essentially five and three with those losses being those good teams. I, I think the, the question becomes like in conference play, you know, could they have, would they have beaten USF? Would they have beaten UAB that first time when it went to overtime? Like those games, like if they had a full season together, how well, those would those games, Those games, yes, I think so. Yeah, you win those games, but I don't know if that changes the season like overall, yeah, you know, like in, conference, still in the NIT. Yeah. I mean, in the conference, you're playing against competition that is similar to you, right? Like, you and I have talked about how much better the AAC has been than Conference USA with FAU, with UAB, with USF, whoever. But when you play those non-conference teams, then it's like you're going to have – it looks like the same outcome would have happened regardless, right? Like if this team, obviously, not full strength would have been a lot worse off against Seton Hall. But I, I don't. I think we overestimated what playing games together uh, I- really would do. I think we the, we overestimated the offensive consistency potentially of this. Yeah, of the, like at full strength, like they're still not going. They were never going to be an elite offense if they were full strength. Like there were just too many hit or miss games from pretty much everybody. Right, there was never. Uh, I, I think CJ coming into his own was, was huge, and he was probably the only guy that you're like every single game was going to go like four of seven for twelve points, and just be like really efficient. Everyone else, you know, Edwards is going to shoot 40%. Ruben's going to have those games where he can't miss. He's going to have those games where he was like one of five, one of four, whatever he was. Aaron, same thing. So it ultimately, the offensive talent on this team was good, but it wasn't like, I think, I don't remember what I said about the 2019. Oh, that was last podcast. We said that was the best offensive, offensive showing since the 2019, 2020 team with Javion and Mo and Zach and all them, that team was incredibly consistent offensively. Like that is a different yeah. level of Javion getting the same shots every time. Mo getting making the same shots every time. Like those guys just didn't they it didn't feel like they had off games to that point. Uh Zach, similar thing, right? James Reese, I know he was a little hit or miss his first year, but like same thing. So I think we I might have overestimated and I was kind of excited from that LSU game because we hadn't seen that offense in a long time. But um there was no reason to really expect that they'd be able to sustain that for they would have had to win five straight games to win the NIT and done that against really, really good teams. I think it would have been better not to see them go down twenty four to Seton Hall though. Yes. <laughs> um let's put a cap on the season. Uh nineteen and fifteen overall, ten and eight in conference play. Uh where did they end the year in luck rating con? Let's see. Probably let's take I'm gonna guess fourth to last. They were third to last last time. So maybe they moved up. They did move up. No, they didn't. Oh. Oh, yes, they did. Sorry. 356th in luck. So what is that? They moved up four spots out of 362. So are there any um, really good teams below them in luck? No. No. Incredible. I will say Wake Forest is one spot above them, and they didn't they missed the tournament barely as well. But below them, no, it's no team is has a winning record. Nice. They're the only team with a winning record that is is that low. Incredible. So and like I said, Wake Forest is right above them, so they have a winning record. But regardless, North Texas ends the year 19 to 15. I think this year will kind of be thought about in two ways. The first being at Ross, Ross Hodges' first season. That's how I will remember this season. Be like, all right, this is the year Ross took over. I think Ross built a a roster that could compete at full strength with anybody in the conference. Like best, best case scenario, I think they could have gone probably like 14 and four if they're full strength and everything clicks. Mm-hmm. That's my belief. I think Ross showed that he has steps to take forward as, you know, an end game coach, potentially, you know, late games, especially um, may, I'm sure he's kicking himself for some games that they lost where it's like, Oh, I should have made this sub or drawn this play. You know, he'll learn from all that. 
And while he was a very, very successful head coach back in the day in the junior college ranks, like there is a, a learning curve to a degree whenever you do have to take this step forward. Um, everything we've heard, um, I talked to people around, you know, North Texas team and everything, and they all the players love playing for us. Like the way that they played in this NIT, especially the LSU game and the preparation for it, like – these guys loved playing for Ross this year. And that was obviously a con not a concern, but it was a question mark as well as, all right, got the returners, Aaron, mm -hmm. Ruben, you know, Sissoko, those guys. How do they handle, you know, Ross being the head coach now? And you know, everything I've heard is that they've loved it. It's been incredible. So you, I think you pass all of those tests from roster construction to being able to, um, get the team to buy in all those things. He checks those boxes, but now it's just about, you know, winning the close games, you know, winning, not even saying you have to, you know, get to the second round of the NCAA tournament next year or anything like that, but it's just winning the close games and learning as a coach to where you're not in this position, uh, you know, where you lose to Fordham on the road or on, you know, a semi road game. And, you know, those early season losses that just kind of kill your momentum. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think Ross did a fantastic job. I mean, I, I mean, we maintained that pretty much the whole year. I mean, through the yep. injuries, yep. especially through the injuries, that really showed to me that he's able to – I mean, we knew this or we thought this, but that he's really able to hold his own. Like, I mean, that was brutal. Having to play – I mean, Matthew Stone really played like 28 minutes a game. Yeah. Well. Like, I mean, so, I mean – not not a shot at Matthew Stone, but you know it's not Conference USA. You know that's all I'm saying. Like no disrespect to Matthew Stone. Yeah, yeah, like I'm not trying to I'm not trying to hit him hit him with anything. But like you didn't have Rondell to start the season. You get you get Ruben. You get your two lead guards injured before we know what Jason even is, right? Yeah. Um, coming up from JUCO, so I think I think he did, he's done a great job, especially with the pressure of having to. And I, I don't think it, we've really talked about this enough. Is the pressure of having, having to follow up who's probably the greatest coach that North Texas basketball has ever had in Grant. Like yeah. you, there might be somebody from a long time ago. I know like, tr I mean, Johnny Jones, I'd say Grant was better. Yep. Uh, like you're following up Grant McCaslin. He's at tech. He just went to the tournament. Like yep. you're following up that guy and, and to fill his shoes. I think Ross did a really great job. Yeah. I think this year was huge for, maintaining the foundation that was set and maintaining and eventually you hope to build on it, but maintaining what McCaslin built. I mean, that's always the concern is when you hire from within, it's like, all right, you're wary that it's not going to be able to sustain because it's hard to sustain. And it takes really a lot of great leadership and buying in to sustain it. And then when you lose McCaslin, you lost coach B, you know, coach Reams at Kansas state, so on and so forth, you bring in a whole new assistant staff and they maintained like I, you know, if McCaslin was head coach of this team, maybe, you know, like I said, maybe there's some in-game stuff that he does differently that wins them a game or game or two. But overall, with the injuries that this team had, it's not going in a hugely different direction. So uh, I agree. Ross had a very, very good season. I'm excited to see where he goes next. Um, Off-season-wise, or I guess big-picture-wise, defensively i think they're going to be fine moving forward i do think rebounding has got to be a big emphasis moving forward and if we just get into the off season as a whole it's you have to shore up the center position i think in a big way like that you can't sissoko was underwhelming i think we're, we're we agree with that robert mm -hmm. allen is a sixth year senior I, who i loved but he also was undersized and you end the year 314th in defense rebounding percentage. Yeah. Like that's that's never been where North Texas has been at. So, and 300th in two point percentage on offense. So you're not finishing at the rim. You're not getting those easy buckets that they were getting with Zach and Dang and so on. So um I think the center position is is critical at this point. I think um, centers and and maybe to a lesser extent wings as well. I don't. I think I think moving up into the AAC, it's harder mm -hmm. to run a smaller lineup. I mean, obviously yeah. the bigs we've already talked about, but even in the wing, like like Rondell was good, but you had to play Matthew Stone a lot just short just because of his size, right? For mm -hmm. rebounding, like there was tons of times this season where like, why is Rondell not out there? Rondell, I don't think is shorter, but he's not as physical as as mm -hmm. Matthew Stone can be. 
Um, so I think even the wings, and that'll also help with scoring in the paint because you're able to get slashers and guys that can cut to the basket and not have to rely on just the center position. This year's team was 248th in the country in height. Yeah. Um, there were games, especially early in the year, LSU, St. John, so on, where or at Mississippi State, where they were just bigger. And if you're going to compete with those teams, you have to be at least a little bigger. Like I, I mean, even and, FAU, and the UAB. Thing is, yeah, I agree. Yeah, those teams as well. The five position I talked about, I think also there is something to Aaron as a four, either if he, we'll talk about, you know, individuals in, in the coming week, in the coming uh, seg- segments of the podcast, but like, at the four, Aaron isn't an elite defensive rebounder. He's not Thomas Bell, right, as far as right. physicality goes. So not only are you short, but, like, Robert Allen and, and Aaron Scott aren't, like, the most wide-bodied physical guys here. So you just don't have that type of mass that they usually have. Um, so I'm that's probably my main thing going into the offseason. It's like, all right, whatever, you figure out – you'll figure out like I'm not worried about them with guards like I just think they can get guards you can get good guards in the portal I think fairly easily but like bigs and just getting guys that can match up physically in the front court is going to be my biggest thing I think how do you see them recruiting in the future because we haven't really seen a lot of like in the past it was like they try to get guys to develop and obviously you'd also get the transfer guards yeah but like on the bench like outside of guards, like I don't think. I mean, you have Chris Morgan is that your big? That you like? Like I feel like you gotta. They gotta focus more on that. It's complicated because obviously the transfer portal, right? They, um, they added, um, where would it go? I mean, obviously Christian Moore is a sophomore. Alex Cotton is a is a freshman that they like a lot, six five. So we'll see if they can develop him. Like those two, if you keep them in theory, should be like contributors next year. Like um, now Christian Moore is 5'11", so it kind of was redundant when you had Jason Edwards already. Um, now, if we look at these players and say, all right, and I think we, we've already, we did on like the last podcast or two podcasts ago where we were like, all right, who should leave, who should stay? Someone's going to leave. Like oh, yeah. players are going to leave who, who, who it is. I don't know. And where, when, it, where, when it is, I don't know. The fact that none of them have entered the portal yet is, <laughs> is um kind of a surprise because the portal has been open now for a week, a week, uh, eight days. So they haven't had anybody into the portal yet. I would assume that they're going to have players into the portal, like two, three, four, players four players into the portal who are they losing off eligibility just just uh nobody Allen? or just robert, robert. yeah it's robert but, Allen. but i mean in terms of the core that they yeah. had so <clears throat> again i'd be shocked if they don't lose anybody or if they only lose one player to the portal like that just it would just shock me so you're gonna and honestly i'd be okay with it to a degree like depending on who it is obviously but like you know if there was some shuffling around of personnel like i think North Texas could use a spot or two for the transfer portal. Yes. I, yeah, I know what you're saying. Like, you don't want to lose, like, you don't want to lose Aaron or Ruben or yeah. guys like that, Jason, Jason whatever. Um, but you also need to raise that average talent on your roster. Yeah. Like if you get an injury, it's going to be hard having to play freshman Christian Moore and Urzi. And maybe, says and maybe they know like more that. about Christian Moore and Alex Cotton than we do as terms of their potential to help them next year. If they can help next year, then but I even but fine. even if they can help, I, I I think you still need spots to find a wing to find a a big yeah. guy like you were saying because you need a five. If, if, say 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 best case, you don't lose Ruben, you don't lose uh, Jason. I'm um, assuming CJ staying, and you bring in two more guards, six five and five eleven. What's the rotation looking like at that yeah. point? Because redundant. Yeah, um, someone's gonna have to sit. They need a they need a seven footer, six eleven guy. I think I think the FAU game. And the UAB game, less to your extent, really showed that you have to do that. Because I don't think, like, Aaron did his best against uh, Lindbergh. Is that his name? Yeah, Lindbergh. Yeah. Yeah. And that guy is just, he's just 
like you said, he's bigger, wide body. Yeah, they got two guys there that are you would be that are just bigger than us. FAU has a five that's just bigger than North but a Texas. true five. And I think yeah. I think that we thought I think everyone thought that Mulai was going to be that this year after that NIT. Yeah, and it unfortunately just didn't pan even, out that way. Even then, he's still not that tall. Like yeah, six. He's listed as six nine. He kind of like six eight. But I mean, physically, maybe? you know like what I mean. Physically, like, yes, he's strong enough. But still, they shot over him plenty of times. Like he's true. not, and he's not a dominant rebounder by any means. So I'm just, I understand size can be deceiving in terms of like just going to get the toss player, but I don't know. You kind of need it. You need some, some height here to, to add to this team. Um, we'll definitely do podcasts if, and when they do have portal news incoming or outgoing. Um, I think North Texas has been, you know, they've, there's always those lists of like, so and so is in the portal. Here's who's oh, yeah. contacted them, and it's like yeah. a billion teams. North Texas has been in a couple of those, and they're good so, players. Yeah, so they're they're not sitting on their hands. Is what I'm yeah. trying to say. They understand what the situation is. I assume at some point we get a couple a player or two leaving, and then they'll be on the on the trail to go get another one. They only have one player signed right now for the 2024 class, right? The kid from Arkansas. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm looking it up now. No, you're fine. Um, yeah, Lane Taylor. Oh, then they have uh, this Tyron Matt Mason kid from Plano um, as well. So they have two side right now. Mm. So that's just in that you're going to have to free up a spot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, at least a spot. So, yeah. so worst case, say Aaron Rubin. They've done their thing. They're trying to move up. They're gone. Jason, again, this is worst case. Jason's like, okay, I can score anywhere I want. He goes somewhere. Yeah. And then you lose Robert. How do you think this team recovers from something? Like, because I think you're going to lose an important piece, right? And I think it's important to talk about. Yeah. How, I, how, I, how, how do you think they can replace that? It depends on the position. I think if it's Jason you can go get a score from the junior college ranks again. You've done it five – you or you've done it three straight times, right? <laughs> yeah. You've done and went and gotten an all-conference first team selection out of, the, out of the junior college ranks three straight times. I think they could do it again. I'm not – and Ross Hodge is as plugged into the junior college ranks as anybody in the country. Um, so him and them evaluating guard scores, I'm not worried about. This is also an offense that I think is conducive to guard scores. Like if you're Ross Hodge and you walk into a Juco's who just averaged 25 points per game, you walk into his, uh, you know, apartment or whatever. You're like, hey, you took call him on the phone. Be like, hey, I don't know if you've seen, but like we have the like five straight all conference first team players, and we're they they all average like 20 points per game. Like just come here and we let you you cook, which I think is an underrated thing when people think of North Texas. It's like. Oh, they play slow. It can be ugly at times. Yes, that's true. But Jason Edwards just scored 21 points a game in conference. Like Javion Hamlet was player of the year. Tyler Perry was player of the year. Like there's tangible evidence now where you can sell that on a recruiting trail to be like, hey, come play for us and you'll get, you're going to get points. So yeah. I'm not worried about the guard position. My bigger concern, I think, I think losing Aaron would be big defensively because you've gone from similar to the point guard thing is you've gone from Thomas Bell to Aaron Scott defensively. And that's been really, really good for them to where their four position has always been a, a strength, right? Defensively. Yeah. So how do they kind of replace that? That would be probably a bigger concern of mine. Um, who was it before Thomas? I'm, why am I blanking? Before Thomas? Thomas was there so long, dude. Never mind. It was just Thomas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, never mind. It was just Thomas. <laughs> Thomas was there forever. I, Shane? <laughs> Mike Miller. I guess there Mike you go. Miller. Mike Miller. Um, but no, so it's a... Like, that's what they've always had in that four, four spot, and it's... That'll be interesting to see if they can do that. But you just gotta go get our tough. But like, if you lose, what if you lose like a Ruben, who is a great defender? He's also six yeah. five, and yeah. can those are distribute. those are the tougher ones. Though, yeah, that's that's it's tough to find a guard like that. I think. because his combination of size, shooting, ball handling, is is tough. So, but 
with the portal, I think North Texas is in a great, great spot to land those CJ Nolans, to land the Walkers, to get those guys that drop down as well. Um, there are players that like similar to CJ Nolan who spent two years at Oklahoma. I mean, there are players that spent one year at like a big school and they're like, ah, I, I didn't play or something like that. And they, they leave. I mean, it happens all the time. So you can go get, you can supplement a lot of talent from the portal. And I, I think it would be short changing your off season. If you only added like one transfer. Like, what honestly, no I one, think you should be adding two, at least two transfers every every offseason. What if no one goes? Someone's got to leave. <laughs> Someone has to leave. Someone has to leave. And, I, and I, I love this team. Great guys. Great team. But, uh, yeah, well, okay, what if they ran it back? And we'd I know that's think about, we, we, me, but we, we'd, have, we'd have to think about who would improve. I think Aaron can still improve a lot. I think I Ruben can improve as a score in terms of like interior scoring. Uh, I think everything else is perfect. Jason, I still think just, they need a five. Yeah, but I'm just going down what they got right now. Yeah, Jason, he's going to do his thing. CJ, I think he can improve a little bit more. His shooting, his three point shooting toward the end down the stretch is good. If he can continue, that'll be yeah. really good. When we start to get to Mulai. Do I think that Mulai can become a lot better? I think his role is probably limited to backup, and this is where you have to get yeah, somebody on the inside. Um, Ron Dell, as much as I love him as a defender, especially an off-ball defender, yeah, I need to see something something offensively. He sh- he made like six threes all season or shots. It was some weird set I heard on one of the broadcasts. So is Ron Dell – I love Ron Dell, but is he going to be a guy that if you're trying to make take this team to the next level – where he's not a not a he's not a negative on offense because I think he does some things, but he's not a shooter, right? He's a a three, a wing that can't shoot, and that's that's tough in any basketball nowadays. Yeah. Um I mean then you get to like stone and I if yeah. anyone's gonna transfer, it's probably stone. <laughs> <laughs> just just so we talk stop talking about him. <laughs> um yeah, I, I don't have too much else. Anything else here stands out on the season? What a roller coaster year it was. Here's here's a question. Regardless of whether they run it back or they lose somebody or whatever, what's your expect early expectation going to next season? With the success of this season. Expectation or hope? Like expectation to me is twelve and six in conference. At least. But what does that look like? Like thirteen and five in conference. Like, we thought, okay, we thought, okay, top, because, top three in con- top three in the American. Okay, where where I think they should have been this year, right? Like or going to the year it was like all right, FAU, Memphis, and then who's gonna be third? You know, whatever the hell happened with USF where they went crazy, cool. But like top three in the American should be, I don't want to say the standard, but border like pretty much yeah, the standard. Or I mean, at least top four should be the standard every single year because you're giving yourself then a chance with the double buy to be what UAB UAB came in fourth this year, right? Like you get the double buy, you just have a much easier path at make at winning the tournament. Yeah. Right? So I think the expectation should be top four. I, I know we change that from top three, but yes, top four. Yeah, every year, every year should be top four. So. Um, they were off that mark this year. It was tight, but we'll see um, how that is moving forward. And that's it. Anything else? Don't think so. All right. Good. 30 minutes. Time flies when we do these podcasts. I know. Uh, we're going to get on football maybe Tuesday, Thursday. It's a busy Tuesday. Time. It's a busy time. Maybe Thursday. I can't do Friday, I realize, because AU. So, because Easter's on Sunday. We have the t- our tournaments Friday, Saturday. So Bernie's, Bernie's a busy bee. Wow. Busy, busy bee. Yep. Had to wow. yell at some kids yesterday to rebound. How do you yell at kids? I can't imagine yelling at I'm kids. I yell at anybody. But I can't imagine you doing that to anybody that's not like coming at you. Like you're so you're so level headed unless someone like comes at you. No, dude. No, it it gets you gotta you get, get red in the face. Got to, got to get upset. You got to get. You get. Do you get red in the face? Like, do you like when you yell? Like, do you yell? Yesterday, like, I got like, pissed. Do you yell like Ross? 
I think so, but not not consistently. Just I, I'm just I'm an energy. I try to be an energy guy, you know, like an mm-hmm. energy type of assistance where it's like, all right, come on, we gotta go to the. Um, well, well, like like overly positive energy. No, it's both. It's mixed. Like if there's if there's a, if there's a spectrum, you got Reem on the overly positive, <laughs> and then you got like I don't even know who would be on your side, Bob Knight. <laughs> Well, I'm just trying to like like Ross is very positive, but he's very serious positive. Yeah. So where are you um, in that spectrum? I think I'm a serious positive. Serious positive. Yeah, I think I'm. I think I try to model my game after Ross. Mm-hmm. For sure. So you got any recruits that he can take? You know, like six years, six years from now. Hey, they're about to be sophomores, Colin. So oh, not that far off. Well, maybe six years. Yeah, maybe. Junior <laughs> and then Ross will find him. Uh, no, not at the moment. All right. I got to get back to work, Colin. We are busy people. Busy, busy people. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for joining us. Leave us a like, comment, share, subscribe. Uh, thank you all for joining us on another great basketball season. Um, thank you all for watching all of our basketball content. We really enjoy it, obviously. Um, we have a great time with it, and we hope you all do too. So we'll be back on the football train football offseason talk, all that stuff. We might do a projected depth chart, whatnot. Who knows where it'll take us. But stay tuned to the green room, and we will talk to you all later.